This is part of the problem. We're going to concentrate on finding the expectation value of the position as well as the expectation value of the momentum, which is going to be a little bit later down. So we can go ahead and start with the expectation value of position. Of course, as always, we're going to start with the momentum, uh, excuse me, the position operator sandwiched in between these two wave, function, wave functions here, one of them being the complex conjugate. And we're going to go ahead and use this property, which we found, this value, which we found in a previous part of the problem. I believe it was the, the just just before this one. Um, anyways, since the momentum operator doesn't really do anything to the wave function itself, it just multiplies it. It can actually just move, get moved up over here. And then these two terms right here end up becoming the... Um, magnitude squared of the wave function. So we'll go ahead and do that. It saves us a good amount of algebra and math. And now we can go ahead and put into our actual values. I'm going to go ahead and drop the limits of the integral for the sake of brevity. So x times the quantity of all of that stuff in there. So let's go uh, let's go ahead and just do 25. We'll just go ahead and write it out. A lot of brackets, but that's okay. All right, do I got all my parentheses and brackets? Okay, that might have been overkill, but that's okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and distribute the x into the constituent linear combinations and move this value to the outside, 1 over 25. Okay, integral. And here we go. We'll go ahead and just... Actually, we'll just go ahead and distribute the integral to each one. So we're going to have a different integral for each linear combination. So x times... And pull that 9 out in front. 9, here we go, now we're getting some good momentum, no pun intended, even though this is the position operator, actually that cosine here, this cosine omega t is a constant in terms of that interval, so we can go ahead and pull that out, let's see here, um, <laughs> cow, yep, Sphere oh my gosh. Spherical cow. Alright. Cosine omega t. Oh, thank gosh. Alright. Got a little mumbled up there, but we're okay. Flashbacks from classical mechanics, I guess. Spherical cows. In bracket. Dx. Oops. No dx. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and look at each one of these and see what they could possibly uh, be equal to. So, so I actually forgot the x here. That spherical cow really messed me up. Um, so if we look at this one, uh, this one's actually going to be equal to zero. And the reason why it's going to be equal to zero is if we draw out the simple harmonic oscillator for the ground state and the first excited state. So let's just say this is the ground state. And this one's the graph for the first excited state. So the ground state for the simple harmonic oscillator of the wave function looks like something like that. Obviously, a little bit more prettier and symmetrical. And for the first excited state, it looks like that. Well, it crosses the... Um, it makes more sense to do that, you know? Okay. So the actual value for the position, for, um, for the expected value of the position is right here in the center, despite my artistic drawing. And so whenever you calculate the value for that, this is just the expectation value for the ground state. And this is just the expectation for the first excited state, expectation value of the position. They're just going to equal to zero. So that's convenient. This, on the other hand, is a whole nother, uh, I wouldn't say mess, but a whole nother beast that we're going to have to wrangle with. But We'll just go ahead and clear it up here. Times 24. Cosine omega t. Oh, you know what? We'll get rid of the brackets. 
So just be 24 over 25. Cosine omega t. There we go. And x. Okay. And again, these are from negative infinity to positive infinity, but I just go ahead and dropped it for the sake of brevity. Now we can actually uh, replace these two values with what we found in the textbook. Textbook has, um, let's go ahead and just treat these as one big glob of constants. The textbook has those as um, two uh, negative exponentials with some constants out in front. The constants are important, but right now we're just going to go ahead and write them out. So this, the, the one I'm writing right now is just the ground state of the wave function for the simple harmonic oscillator. And again, if this is uh, kind of just blindsided you, this was explained in the textbook. I highly recommend you go back and see uh, how the author arrived at this point for these two values. And then negative exponential. Okay. Did I lose any brackets? I don't think so. All right. So now we're just going to go ahead and massage this into a more manageable form. Go ahead and drop down this glob of constants. Uh, let's see here. First things first, let's pull out some constants. Those are two um, quarter roots being multiplied by each other. So they're going to turn into half roots or square roots. All right, and then let's see here. This is a glob of constants, so we can just go ahead and move out that to the front. We'll just turn this into a one-half, so it can be like its friend sitting out in front. And now we have these two exponentials multiplied by each, by each other. Since they have a one-half in the exponential, we'll just go ahead and get rid of that one-half when we multiply them by each other. All right, great. So this might be a familiar integral. It might not. I recommend just uh, looking up an integral table or a uh, doing it in a calculator, and then we'll do so many of these in quantum mechanics that we'll realize that they're pretty common. So. Anyways, whoops, I think I might have went a little bit too fast there, but that integral is actually, excuse me, that integral is actually equal to um, square root of pi over 2, and then multiplied by uh, the glob of constant in the negative exponential, and that negative constant for this one specifically is negative 3 halves. Okay, so we can go ahead and just let's just explicitly write out all of our constants so we can do our math, a little bit of bookkeeping here. So, let's see here, 24 over 25, not cow. Okay, so let's go ahead and look around and see what we can do in terms of canceling things out. Let's do some bookkeeping here. So is there anything we can get? I don't think so, not yet. Let's see here. Let's see here. These are the negatives. So these are being multiplied by each other right here. So we can go ahead and pull those out into the front. So 
So <clears throat> the M, the omega, the H bar all come out of the square root and all that's left within the square root is a two and a pi all under the square root. And then we have a pi two and then and we'll just go ahead and for the sake of ease, we'll turn this into something easier to work with here. Negative one. We're just turning this three halves into these two parts here for these bookkeeping. So let's go ahead and start doing that bit bookkeeping. So first things first, we have these two terms here, which totally cancel out. So those cancel out. We have this pi under the square root and this pi under the square root. So now all that's left is Oh, you know what? We can go ahead. Let's go ahead and throw this 2 and 2. I'll turn that into this 24 and turn this 24 into a 12. So now we have 12, 25, cosine, mega t, times the square root of 2, and then m omega h bar all under a negative one half. All right, so that is our expectation value of the position. Now we can move on to the expectation value of momentum, which classically, well, I wouldn't necessarily say classically, but just in general is equal to the product of the mass and the rate of change of the expectation value in terms of time. So we'll go ahead and just throw that in there. Uh, well, the derivative of this in respect to time, the thing I just circled is equal to, let's go ahead and throw our constants out. The der derivative of the cosine of omega t in respect to time is all this with a negative sign out front. So let's go ahead and make some room. I guess I could have just moved that equal sign, but we'll just throw that negative sign here. And that is our uh, momentum expectation value. Now we had kind of a bonus question that the author likes to throw in. Just making sure that the... Um, <clears throat> what would happen if we had the first energy or the second energy state instead of the first energy state? What would the frequency be? So if we see right here, the frequency is, is just omega here. But if we had the uh, second excited state instead of the first excited state, remember that the expectation value up here, the expectation value up here, goes like something, something, global constant times. That's where the frequency shows up in terms of multiply my time. So it goes, it's proportional. It goes something like this. It goes like cosine, cosine. Actually, it goes like two cosine omega t, right? And the reason why, if we if we think about the cosine omega t, the real, if, if you look at that, the first part of the problem, or the earlier parts of the problem, the reason why we got to this cosine was that originally we had, we turned that, these two exponentials from the earlier part of the problem into that cosine, right? And the whole reason why we got to this identity here of these two exponentials being summed to each other was that omega was actually equal to the difference between the first and the ground state uh, over h bar, right? So if you're confused by this, go back to the, the earlier parts of the problem and you'll see the identity that we did where the difference between the first and second energy state was h bar omega. And that's, of course, how we were able just to get omega because this is all over h bar, right? So if instead we had the second excited state 
over h bar, this actually would have been 2 omega because the difference between each uh, adjacent energy states in the simple harmonic oscillator are, has a difference of h bar omega. This would have been a difference of 2 h bar omega. So the frequency would have been doubled if we had the second excited state vice the first excited state. Now we have like a bonus, bonus question talking about Ernfast's um, relation theorem. I have to look back at the textbook. But basically we have to show that the time derivative of momentum is equal to the negative expectation value of how the potential energy changes in respect to space. Excuse me. And again... If you're confused by this, going through back through the textbook, you'll find that the this is a prox this is the change of the potential energy in respect to space, the change of space, the curvature of space is equal to this. So first things first, let's just show what this is equal to. So if we take the time derivative of momentum. Where are we going to get? I think we can do that pretty quickly. So we have M. It's going to take longer to write it out than to actually do the, cal the calculation. Okay, so now we do another time derivative of this. We got no negative sign, but we get another omega that pops out. So omega squared and then cosine omega t, right? Now... If we do this instead, specifically this, we'll, we'll get, hopefully, what ends up being the same thing, negative omega squared times the expectation value of x here, which we found out was this. We'll just go ahead and multiply m omega. Oops, I left it out. m omega, negative sign, of course, times the expectation of value of x, which was 12 over 25, cosine omega t, square root 2, times that global constants. Now we just compare those two. So we have a negative m, negative m, omega, omega. Then we have this term here. We have our square roots. We have our cosine omega t. And finally, we have our negative square root of constants. So we have shown that this actually works out for the simple harmonic oscillator. So it appears everything we did was correct.